well, I'm going to cover the sales presentation because I think if we talk about that first, then you'll know how we set it up for the phone call. Okay, so it's sort of working backwards. But you know, in success books, I think in um, I think it's out of Napoleon Hill, uh, begin at the end in mind. Know what you're trying to accomplish, and then everything up to that point is all supporting that end. Okay, so you got to know what the destination is. Okay, now ultimately the destination, Glenn, is someone who buys a policy and then keeps it forever until they die or until it lapses. Okay, like I mean, at the end of the 30 year term, 20 year term. To me, that's the ultimate goal. Now, we know that doesn't always happen because you have chargebacks from people that cancel, you know, within the advanced commission period, right? We have people that um, change their minds later, the buyer's remorse thing. We have all those things that everyone else has. But if you learn our system properly, you'll have the opportunity to really minimize those things, okay, so that you're not going to run into those. Because it is a natural part of the insurance business is, is people lapsing and people not taking their policies. Okay, but we're going to try to do GMU is we're going to try to make it real minimal. Okay, like I'm sure in Nigeria, <coughs> They probably don't ever lapse their policies, wow. or they don't ever cancel, do they? They cancel a lot. They, they cancel a lot? Okay. Well, so do Americans, strangely enough, too. <laughs> so we got to do it right, making sure that we have a, what I call a righteous sale, okay? That everything is all in place so that you maximize your time away from your family when you go, go out and serve families. Because I'm sure, Barry, you don't want to be an unpaid consultant, right? Uh, I've been there. Been there, done that. I right? used to call myself a professional visitor. That. Yeah, that's right, professional visitor. And yeah, let's talk about that. Really, kind of the, the whole mentality is that when you have a lead and you call it and you set it up and they describe how to get to their house and they let you in their house, okay, understand that, you know, we probably book about half of our leads into appointments and then. You know, depending on how good you are on the phone, will determine if you have a 30% no-show rate or a 50% no-show rate. And then by the time you get into their house and get through all those gauntlets, you know, it, it takes a lot to finally get in there. And the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to blow it. Blow the opportunity, because it, you know, because you know how hard it is, right, Hank, to get a hold of people. It's terrible. That is the hardest, in my opinion, the hardest thing in this business is getting a hold of people on the phone. Yeah. Okay? In my opinion. Bar, you know, people say, well, it's my closing and objections. You know, you don't even have a chance to do that until you can get in the house. So <coughs> when you, once you get here, once you get through all that stuff, when you get in the house, you have a choice. Now, let me draw it out like a, a, a true computer geek. Okay, there's your decision box. Okay. I know Barry's going, oh, <laughs> going having a syllogism right, right now. This is the decision box right here. You can either use your sales system or the client sales system. Okay. Now, what's the client sales system, Donna? They go through a process of what? I'm telling you what they want. Stealing your rates, right? So they steal your rates. They, they, they're really good salespeople, by the way. Clients are really good at getting the price in, the prices out of you, aren't they? They pull those rates <coughs> out of you, so they steal your rates. They interrupt your pattern. Totally. Yeah, you, they steal your rates. Then what do they say? I want to think about, about it. Think about it. Mm. <laughs> I want to think about it. I want to shop. I, I want to, the infamous, I want to think about it. You know, Alan, how many of those have you gotten in your sales career? No. Hey, if you got a dollar for every time that happened, man, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I mean, anybody's been in sales. So they, they give you to think about it, and then you go home with nothing to show for it after driving, spending four bucks in a gallon of gas, going to their house, going through New Jersey traffic, you know, where it should take five minutes, it takes you 30, 45 minutes, and then get there, and you follow their sales system. But see, what's beautiful about it is this sales process is in your control. If you take control and you guide them through your sales system, okay, your sales system puts them through a five, well, a six-step process of finding their need, okay, creating in them trust, 
right? Trust, trusting you, creating in them belief in you that what you're saying is true and that you're genuinely wanting to help them. Okay, so it's kind of this pattern of, because of the process of a sale, the results of a sale is the client believes you, well, they, they trust you, they believe you, okay? They have a need, and they want what you're showing them. They need it, they want it, and they can afford it. And I'm throwing here, understand. That understanding part is based on, do they trust you and believe you? Then what you're laying out, do they understand it? Do they need it, want it, and afford it? It's gotta meet this test, okay? If it meets this test, then it's a righteous sale, okay? And I'm gonna teach you the six steps that you progress someone through. Okay, and then I'm, you know, I'm gonna also go into um, key elements to ensure that your placement and persistency is the highest it can be if you follow the discipline of the process. Here's what's crazy that some agents do, Barry, is they'll get in the home and they'll think, oh, this is going to be easy. But it's the clients all over me. They, I can tell they want to pull out their checkbook. The biggest danger is you think you don't have to do this, and then by the time they're, you're about ready to write, okay, can I have a check for $159.36? Uh, well, we were thinking that, you know, it sounds great, and we really want it, and Barry, you are so nice. We like you. You're about the honest, most honest salesperson that we've ever met. But, <laughs> and then fill in the smoke screen. We want to think about it. Right. You have, you have no, no, you have no idea how many times, like some of my top salespeople, when they abandon the discipline of following the process, come up with those situations. Or they'll call me and say, Alex, golly, my place in persistency has gone down to like 65%. What's going on? I go, I go, I have no idea. I thought you were following the system. I thought you were good. I thought you were turning in all this premium per month. I go, well, let's step through the process, the six steps. Well, did you do bottom report? Well, I'm good. I, I'm good. I, you know, I, I didn't, I, you know, they like me. Oh, that's cool. Did you do the pain process to find out their pain? Well, they told me they really wanted it, so I didn't feel like I had to do that. Oh, okay. Well, did you do an upfront contract with them that if you show them what they need, that they're gonna take care of it tonight? And then they're gonna be done with it, and you're gonna take care of them. Well, I mean, they told me they liked me, and you start seeing where it breaks down. It starts to break down from day one, from step one, and then it just goes to hell the rest of the time, you know? So I, I encourage you, Nelson, especially since you're new, okay, it's like, it's like making a sandwich, dude, at Subway. I mean, you, if more of my guys did what you did in a Subway shop making a sandwich, because what do you, you got to ask, for what kind of bread do you want? So you lay the bread out, then you kind of cut out the middle, okay? And then you go through the process of what, you know, what kind of sandwich, it's an Italian, Italian, so you take that piece of meat thing that, in the wax paper, and you slap it in there. It's a production line, isn't it? And then by the end, I, I mean it's true. I mean, it's not out of the out of the realm. It's exact, dude. If you did this like you did that day in day out, week in week out, you're going to make money, and you're going to have a happy customer that's going to keep their policy. Okay, does that does that make sense? So, I mean, do what a Subway sandwich artist does. Follow the same process in your system, and it'll work time and time again. And, and it's a filter, right, Barry? It's, it's perfect. It filters out the people that are serious about taking care of their families and will keep their policy in it. It filters in those people and filters out the pretenders that really don't care. Because if you're so good, Donna, at selling a pretender, then that's just a chargeback waiting to happen. Like what's a pretender? A single guy who doesn't care if they foreclose on his home if he dies. 
you think that if you, you're so good and sold him a policy, do you think he's going to want to keep it when that $30 a month bill shows up and he had he needs some drinking money for some beer this weekend? Mm -hmm. yeah. right. I hope you're not that good. See, the system's not designed to close 100%. It's, I like that analogy with the sandwich because if, if the customer asks, Nelson put cheese on it and Nelson doesn't put cheese on it when it gets to the end and Nelson asks for the money is the customer going to give Nelson the money the answer is no that's right but the customer said yeah I want the cheese on it exactly or if they 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 say well okay that's cool and then they bite into this like dang it it's got cheese in it what are they going to do they're going to spit it out of their mouth they're going to go to the subway shop hey I didn't want cheese in this thing charge back <laughs> you know what I mean Exactly right. Like my daughter hates cheese. She'll eat pizza, but she hates cheese. It's weird. And you know, she doesn't want anything to have to do with cheese except on pizza. I ask her why why do you like cheese on pizza? She goes, Well it's different when it's on pizza. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So now I'm hungry. Probably now you're hungry. Ah! Let's okay, let's go lunch. It's on me. So I was trying to walk away from that. <laughs> Oh, so you like that subway analogy? I just came up with it. <laughs> Thank you, Nelson, for being here. That's good. I'm going to keep it next time. And I'll, I'll give attribution for you the next time I use it. The next time after that, it's my own, my own analogy. I spent time on this because I want you to understand the philosophy and mindset of, of what we're trying to do in the sale. The, the objective is not to close 100%. It's designed to close 100% of people that care about their families. Because people that care about their families, Ellen, are ones that will keep their policy on the books. Okay. So I'm not I'm not big on the throw mud against the wall thing. Well, Alex, I, I all I want to do is I just want to close them, close them, close them, and then you know then just kind of the ones that stick will stick. It's like oh gosh. The, the problem with doing that is that the ones that really should have stuck won't stick because they think you just try to pull a fast one on them because doing that, Donna, is your like that same window replacement guy who's got pressure to sell every home he goes into. All right. And, you know, it's a chargeback way to have it. Can you tell that I hate chargebacks? Can, can anyone tell that? Taking your money away. You know, it's like when you get beat down enough and you get sick and tired, then it's like, I'll learn my lesson. <coughs> the way the other way, I'm trying to get really good at this thing. Because you imagine you, you put your place in persistence and you go from 75% to where mine was, which was 95%, that's a 20% increase in income. But it's also 20% efficiency in my time, right? Because yes. you have to go out and make those sales. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine making your time more efficient and your income going up? Does, does that rock? You have kind of this double effect, you know? OK, so let's kind of lay it out. And I'm going to um, really go through this process. So it's a, I call, call it a six-step process to making a sale. And those of you who are not in my, on my team, I promise you, you, you go through what Mike Schles will teach you on his sales script. It'll, there's elements in, that they have in all of it. You can evaluate. In fact, when you listen, Alan, to conference calls, you hear sales systems, MP3s, you can fit everything that everyone's doing in each of these categories, in each of these steps. So what I'll give you is a framework to understand how the sales system works. Some people use parts of it, some people don't. Okay, we want to teach our new people the discipline of following it all so that if they do everything, everything's going to be fine. You know, once you get really good, then, you know, at that point you can decide what you want to do to get your results better. But here's the danger, is that when you start messing with the sales system, what you think you're getting more closes mm -hmm. if you mess with it here, you'll get more trouble sometimes can get more chargebacks at the other end. Oh man, I'm closing, we're using this real sales technique, this real cool sales technique. Like this is, here's a, one sales technique and I caution at least our people on. When you tell the client that they've got, well, you've got a month to think about it and then you can cancel it. Now, we, do we know that's true? We all know that's true. It's kind of like saying, telling your kid, don't touch that. Don't, don't touch that. Don't touch that. What do they do? Touch it. They touch it, don't, right? 
It's like telling a client, don't can you know, you're saying, you have a right to cancel, you have a right to cancel, you have a right to cancel. And they're gonna cancel because you tell them they have a right to do it. It's like, it's a, it's a suggestion. It's like this auto-suggestion that you put it in their brain. And some guys think they have a great close because a person thinks, oh, well, I've got 20 days. I can get my money back. I can do all this. I, it's all loose. And man, people run into more placement persistency problems. Some of our top agents in our company, and NAA, I, tr I know the behind the scenes, okay? I talk to the people. And it's like some of the top producers last year had the worst placement persistency in the company. So don't get fooled by all the sales that these guys, some of these guys are doing. They do that soft close. I call it the soft close. And there's a reason why it's soft. So they can, they think they got a sale, but when they come back, you know, a week later, they try to deliver it. Well, we changed our mind. Or they come back, you know, six months later, they find the person canceled. Or, you know, 20 days later, the person canceled. They call them back, hey, I, you know, I thought, you know, you really wanted it. Well, you told us we could cancel, so we just canceled. We don't think we needed it. Right? So, you're so saying, Alex, you're saying never, ever, 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 ever use that close. You're smart. <laughs> you know, because your, hear, your yeah, hearing aid must be turned up. Yeah, I did. I turned it up today. I just uh, okay. never, ever, ever use it. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, Rich. <laughs> anyway, okay, so let me lay it out for you, the six-step process. Step number one, call bond and rapport. Okay, I'm sure you've heard the, the thing that um, people don't buy from you unless they like you. And it's like, oh, God, that's so pedestrian. I'm not down with that. <laughs> they buy from you because, like I said, they trust you, they believe you, they need it, want it, and can afford it. Trust you uh, and understand. Understand you. This bottom report thing is more, it's deeper. It's taking control. There's a lot more to it than that. I'll, I'll go into depth on these. But once you create trust with the client, okay, uh, and belief, then the next step is I call the pain process. Why did they send the lead in? Okay, <coughs> trust me, this thing is not the, a features benefit sale. Okay, you are not going in there and, and talking about the razzle dazzle of mortgage term, don't have to do a blood test. Okay, you have a return of premium, isn't that awesome? You know, and it's level benefit, you're doing the, like the tap dance on how awesome this product is, you're gonna wanna buy it, right? You know, it's not the features benefit sale. This is different, it's consultative, it's finding out why they really want it. In fact, really the whole philosophy is they have to convince you that you're gonna ride them up, right? Is that a little bit different now instead of, well, I'm gonna go sell this client on how great this thing is. You're going in there, they gotta convince you, Donna, that they are a candidate for our programs. And part of that is fun is that they have a reason why. Okay, that's the pain process. Then number three, we call this the up front contract. What that really means is that you're telling the client what's going to happen from here on out. And then they have to agree to it before you move on. All right? <clears throat> because here, I want to know what their objections are. I want to know early in the appointment if they want to think about it and why they want to think about it or if there's any problems with them wanting to take care of this pain. Okay? I have a toothache, it's killing me. Alex, can you help me? Yes, I can. Here's what I can do. I can give you a root canal. Are you good with paying 800 bucks for a root canal and a crown? Uh, maybe I'll use a dentist analogy. Yes, I am. I'm going to pay for it because I can't stand my tooth hurting like, like it is. Great. Okay, give me your Visa card right now and let's schedule it. Please, can we do it right away? You know what I'm saying? That's what we're talking about here, that kind of pain. The upfront contract is designed to make sure that everything is smooth from here on out. You know, by the time you've dealt the first three sections, it's done. Okay? You're trying to surface anything, everything there. Okay, now the upfront contract, there's a fulfillment of the contract. 
we call it fulfillment, okay? You're following through now what you're gonna do. You're gonna find them a price that they can afford and the features that they need to solve their pain. Now here's the thing. Some people think that solving their pain is paying off their entire mortgage, Don, if they die. <clears throat> you know what? That's really, you know, that's what they think the solution is. <clears throat> But, but their pain really is staying in the home without any financial stress. And if it's paying part of the mortgage off while the other surviving spouse has income, right, to pay the remainder of the mortgage amount after refinancing, wasn't well, that achieving the same objective, having their family stay in the home without any financial pressure? Okay, so the solution is going to fit the pain, but it, you have to sometimes convince the client that what their solution is not really all you know it's overkill depending on their budget so you're trying to fulfill their expectations on what you're going to do and I, you know i put like you know present the prices and then close okay step number five i call this a post sell there's three elements of the post sell here's where you're testing your clothes you're testing for buyer's remorse. You're testing that everything up to this point is good, and then you give them every opportunity to stop and get an assessment and not do it. Okay, by the time you're doing this, you're making sure they're closing themselves. Because Don, this isn't, you're trying to close them. They're closing themselves in the process. In fact, that's what's cool about this whole process, Barry, is if you follow this, all the sales pressure is not on you to close them. All the sales pressure is on them to take care of their problem. You're presenting them their options. Okay, again, going back to the toothache. You can either do a root canal and give you a crown, or you can just give you antibiotics, get rid of the infection, and then you can just keep going until the next time you have a toothache. Those are the two options. <laughs> Which one do you want to do? <laughs> like, man, give me, I'll, I'll take a mortgage out to get my tooth taken care of if I had to. Okay, then the final step six is the follow-up and follow-through. Because the sale's not done right here, and the sale's not done after it gets issued. Okay, the sale's done is when you personally place that policy in their hands Okay, and then you follow through the rest of what you got to do to keep a great client. It's called client for life, Alan. We want, this is not a commodity sale, as a lot of agencies treat this market. They treat it as a wham, bam, thank you, man, commodity sale. We're not selling widgets out there. We're selling protection. And we want to help them through the rest of their natural lives and their family and their kids when they get to be of age and wanting to look at programs. We really believe in client for life. Because the most expensive lead is the first lead, right? Everything else, referrals and their family are just icing on the cake. And if you do this properly, this will be a gift that keeps on giving because you will be their person, their agent, really their friend, okay, to help them out. Right, because that's really what we're looking to develop that kind of relationship with our client. Okay, so go bond report, paying upfront contract, fulfillment, post sale, follow through. It's closing the doors of each of these compartments that lets you move on to the next one to determine if everything is tied up. Everything's tidied up. Okay, all the way to the very end. Now, I'm going to go into detail on what's entailed in all of this. Now, Look, I can teach you the sales 404 version, and we can be here for the next six hours, okay? But Nelson, I'm not gonna try to overload you. Because when you start at Subway, did you have to learn how to make all the sandwiches all at one time in the next three hours? No, then you had a progression. You had to figure out, you know, they had to teach you over the course of time. You're gonna get good at all these pieces. I'm just gonna try to give you enough so that you're gonna feel halfway confident to go out there and start booking appointments. I'm gonna give you this foundation. In fact, we want you to memorize the presentation. Oh, really? I gotta work? <laughs> yes, you gotta work. 
Like, how long did it take you, Rich, to pass your exam and study for it? I mean, how many hours did it take you? I took a class, but I didn't. I passed it the first time. You didn't pass it. You passed no, it. I did. Yeah. You did. Yeah. How, how how many hours did you pass? <clears throat> Three days, eight hours. Twenty-four hours. And then, how much did you study after oh, that? A couple of weeks. Like, how many hours in those two weeks? Maybe another twenty-four. Okay, forty-eight hours to prepare to study for your licensing exam, and you passed the first time. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's a lot. But you passed the first time. Yeah, I didn't, no. How about you, Barry? Well, it was kind of start and stop, so I, I did it twice, unfortunately. But both times, you know, probably, for, let's just say the first time I would have passed it. Two weeks. Two weeks. And, and in that time, maybe 20 hours. Maybe. Okay. I, I can't even say 20. Right. You spent time to learn to pass your exam. Why wouldn't you at least spend that same amount of time? Now, it's going to take you 48 hours, Don. It's not. Well, why can't you just spend three hours to memorize the presentation? Look, and Nelson, if all you did was memorize each, what you're trying to accomplish at each step, and you kind of used your own words, you're way further ahead than someone who doesn't even, even know this process, okay? Now, here's one thing that I just want you guys to understand. When I got started in this business, we learned this, a very similar system that had a step-by-step -step approach, okay? <coughs> And what I did was I wanted to make sure, Donna, that I went through every step. So I got a three by five card and I listed every step. I listed step by step by step by step. So I made sure I checked off. You got it? Oh, dude, I love you. <laughs> My Chi Chi. Oh, praise God. <laughs> this is exactly what I did. And I laid it out there. When I'd sit down in the home, I'd lay it out there. Actually, I did mine like this. I did mine long ways. I, I wrote the titles of each step. I put little questions that I had to ask. I laid it right there on the table. You know what? And the client, they don't care. It's kind of like, you know, like when I was in theater. I could mess up on stage, Donna, but they don't have the script. Yep. They don't know. I'm winging it, trying to get back on script, and the, the other actor on stage trying to help me get there. And they have no idea that I messed up. Likewise, you're just putting it out there for you, but that's not professional. You know what? They don't know they don't what is know. professional, what is it? They don't even know what you're doing. They, they don't know exactly. <laughs> that's what I love you. about this. They don't care what you're doing. Lay it out there, and Nelson, just follow the recipe. BMT, baby. That's my favorite sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> On that mozzarella bread. Anyway. So, I know I'm, I'm like my like tummy is starting to rumble. Go step by step by step by step. Give yourself a chance, Rich. It must have been like six months I had that card because I just felt comfortable putting out there. And then I lost the card, right? I think I, actually the client stole it from me. And I said, well, you know, maybe I can hire you next time. Dude, that rocks. Okay? So it's okay to put it out there so you can stay on track. Okay, so let's talk about the bottom of the poor step. This is really, um, there's a lot of things you can do here, but just basically to set it up. I, I want you to set yourself up to win in the home. And I'm going to give you just very, some basic steps, and it's in our script. But I'm going to give you some basic steps to do so you can really take control, okay, and create that bond and poor people. And Donna, it doesn't take, I'm not talking about that, um, where you look at the, oh, I see you have a, a shrine to Dale Earnhardt. You must love NASCAR. Gee, I like NASCAR too. Did you see that race last week? And the only name you know is Jeff Gordon. Gee, didn't Jeff Gordon do great? <laughs> the guy's been catching. He, he finished 23 in a wreck. <laughs> and they can tell that you don't know what you're talking about. But you're trying to create that fake relationship. Now, clients aren't stupid because the guy that showed up last week was a window repair, window, window replacement guy did exactly the same thing. They, they aren't stupid. The bottom part I'm talking about takes about 90 seconds. Okay? And so I'm going to just do some basic steps with you. Here's one thing that I like to do. I like to take my shoes off. Now, some people say, well, I don't want it. I don't like that. I've got holes in my socks. My feet smell. Fix those things. All right? Take a shower once in a while. 
fix your socks, sew them up, or go buy some new ones. What a concept. You know, how many of you have socks that are like 20 years old? I can't get rid of this, my favorite pair. You know, it's all raggedy and everything. You know, I like to take my shoes off because it's a sign of respect. Now, here's where I tell you, you've got to take your shoes off. Is if you walk into a home and you see all their shoes out on the, it's not a shoe store, a used shoe store place, okay? They obviously take their shoes off before they enter their house. A lot of Middle Eastern cultures do that. So if they let you enter their house, you better do what they're doing. Or if you walk in the home, you see a bunch of shoes in the in the entryway. Guess what you're doing, right? Okay. But I do it in every house, and they'll tell you, "Oh no, you don't have to do that. That's okay." Now my my mom would get mad at me if I did do this. <laughs> to me, that's a sign of respect. They're thinking, "Wow, this guy, this gal, you know." Uh, been brought up right. You know, it's like when you have one of your kid's friends come over and they say, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. Automatic, you're looking at them going, I like this kid. He's respectful. Doesn't that make you feel kind of like, and I love when I get, like when your kid is at someone else's home and the parents come up to you, wow, Alex, Athen is just the most gracious boy. He says, thank you. And yes sir, wow, you really raised a good boy. Doesn't that make you feel proud? That feeling of respect is a tremendous one, and you go far to develop that trust and belief by just taking your shoes off, okay? Now, I, you know, I really don't want to, I do want to go through this because I want you to, to do the basics. Shake hands warmly and firmly, okay? Nelson. How you doing? Does that feel good? You can do that. You shake someone's hand. It's just kind of like a wet fish out there. Did, Donna, does that like you've been in business a long time? I'm sure you have a very firm handshake, right? It just like wimpy. It's like ew. I don't. They don't want to do business with. Yeah, me. they don't want to. Why don't they want to touch me? Oh, why don't they want to shake my hand? It's gross. Yeah. <laughs> and do it with like a big smile on your face. I uh, mean, I, I'm, I'm smiling, you know. Hi, my name's Alex. My name's Pedro Santiago. Oh, man, that's good stuff. Well, and, and, and I hold on to the hand until they say who they are. You know, it's just something about that. But, you know, basically it's like shaking hands warmly. Oh, other things. Throw a breath mint in. <laughs> <laughs> but my breath doesn't stink. My, it's funny, my eight-year-old Donna, I was putting her to bed, she goes, Ew, Daddy, your breast stinks. They don't lie, and they don't care about your feelings. Ew, Daddy. I, and I go, it doesn't smell. Daddy, you can't smell your own breath. Why not? Well, you just can't. My eight-year-old daughter. Why is that, by the way? What is it about that you can't smell your own breath? So, man, just do this. Assume that your breath is bad. Let's just do it the opposite way. Assume your breath is bad and pop mint in. Make sure it's fresh because nothing can turn someone off worse. And look, you've been in the field. You went through an appointment, 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 had lunch. Appointment, appointment, appointment. You think by the time all, this, all that bacteria in your mouth has started to, you know, because that's what bad breath is. All the bacteria starts to, it's kind of gross too when you think about it. They start Waste products from little tiny bacteria is what makes your mouth smell bad. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and so just assume your breath is bad. So I'm serious. Breath mint. Here's the other thing, facial hair. Okay. Some people are down with it. Some people are not. You know, if you've got tats on your arms, don't wear, wear long sleeve shirts. Okay, try to be relatable to people. Okay. You know, you can do what you want, but just, you know, cover up the Band-Aid. You know, you're on, your, on, a, on a tap. Anyway, anyway, breath. Those should be like general hygiene stuff, okay? I mean, I really shouldn't have to talk about that to salespeople, but just, you know, I do, okay? I don't have to, but I should. I will, okay? Breath, okay, so here's what you do when you go into the home. You go directly to the kitchen table or dining room table. Just go straight there. Say, hey, your kitchen table over here, just beeline it. 
Because what they'll naturally do is say, well, they're going to treat you like a guest. Hey, here's a couch. Why don't you sit on the couch? Can you pull your laptop out? Can you write applications on a couch? No, it's like the worst, you know, you take control, you go, you go right to the kitchen table, okay? And in the kitchen table, I like to sit in his throne, Donna. This is his throne, the head of the table. I take control. It's a subtle, subconscious thing, but I sit right there. And I tell them where to sit, Jamu. I say, hey, I, I sit myself up here. Hey, Joe, why don't you sit here? And Mary, why don't you sit over here? You know what's amazing is they'll do it. I've never had someone say, well, I don't like to sit there. I've never, in like thousands of appointments, I've never had anyone say that. So I, I sit at the head of the table, I put him there. If it's a woman, you know, Donna or whatever, so you sit here and, bring, and put the wife here. So you're like next to the same sex, okay? And there's a lot of interaction. Now all you Neanderthals out there, who are you talking to in the sales process? Rich, who are you talking to really? Huh? We told the husband. What? The woman, the wife. The wife. The wife. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, she's the one that kind of makes the financial decisions in the home. I mean, is that a kind of a good assumption generally? For the most part, generally, yes. And it, do you think you have a chance if you totally ignore her? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Those of you who are watching this video. <clears throat> I mean, it's common sense. Here's what I like to uh, <coughs> for God, because most of the problem with the guy, the guys are the ones, the male sales guys are the ones that have that problem, typically. But I, I'm talking to her. I give him props, because I'm like, so massaging his ego. Because his is an ego problem. She's the one that makes decisions. I talk to her. If, if I had to like, it's 50-50, but hey, if it's 60-40, it's her, on, you know, on her side. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a mindset on that. Remember, Barry, uh, how long have you been married? 39 years. 39 years. Oh, and do you right. remember the time you met her parents for the first time? Oh, yeah. Does it stick out in your mind vividly? Big time. Big time. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably when you knew you were going to be good in sales, right? When you sell in the parents, right? <laughs> when everyone says, well, I'm not good at sales, are you married? Yeah. Brother, I've seen your wife. You sold her big time <laughs> on you. It's just like that. That's one thing in school, man. I was an expert. You know, high school and college and after college, I was great at meeting the parents. Because I knew if I get the mother to like me and if I charm the mother, man, I'm in. It is done. It is done. And I, but I was doing it, Jen. I just wanted to make sure that the mother liked me. I, I just made sure the father didn't kill me, but if the mother loved me, then everything was going to be cool. That's what I'm talking about. When you go in the home, pretend like the first time you met the parents. You know? Pretend like you're selling the parents' life insurance. Okay? Your attitude's totally different. Selling family. I mean, that's, that's like what we're talking about here. So really focus on kind of what you're doing at the table, where you're arranging, arranging them. Okay, so you can sit them. Okay, here's... Another easy technique for the pedestrian sales guy, ask for some water. Okay, and you're sitting down like, oh, man. Do you mind, ma'am, if, if I can get just a glass of water, please? Whether you're thirsty or not. Why do you think that's effective, Rich? It breaks the ice, calms everybody down. It takes away from the sales presentation. Here's what it does. It puts them in the mindset of you're asking for something and they're complying to you as a guest in the home, right? Asking for some water. It's a kind thing to do to offer someone some water. So you're putting them in a kindness mode, saying, oh man, I've just had a, whew, it's hot out there. Can I have some water? Also, kind of a corollary to that is accept anything they offer you okay now you may not think it's a big deal they say hey Nelson would you like some kimchi we have some right here and you hate kimchi you know that's Korean rock cabbage okay it's real hot it smells pretty bad okay and you know in that culture or in cultures when you refuse a gift it's an insult 
do you want to have to guess which culture? You, you're not going to have like your cultural reference and going, okay, Koreans. <laughs> if I refuse a gift, is it an insult? If you're not going to have that memorized, or you're not going to have that pocketbook with you, are you? <coughs> so what's the best? Say yes. Say yes. <coughs> Accept anything that's offered. It doesn't mean you have to eat it. Okay. And you can just like taste it. Now, if it's apple pie, a la mode, brother, <laughs> excuse me. It's a great program. <laughs> Can I have some more? <laughs> like, just bring the pie out. Let's all have some, you know? Because uh, when I started this business, Donna, I was 128 pounds. <laughs> really, my first, my first appointment, honestly, I showed up a little bit early because I was a little nervous. My first appointment in insurance. And they were, they forgot I was coming over. And they were like, oh, we're just starting dinner. I go, oh, that's cool. Well, maybe I could just sit here and just watch the news or something. No, why don't you have dinner with us? <laughs> really? In my mind, I'm thinking, that's not in the script. <laughs> it's not on my card where I eat dinner, and then we go through the process. <laughs> and I said, well, sure. Uh -huh. What are we having? <laughs> Fried chicken, <coughs> mashed potatoes. Oh my God. I was like, I love this business. I love life insurance. And I'm sitting there, we're eating, and we're just having the best time. We're John back and forth, and hey, would you like some pecan pie for dessert? Oh, God. It's like one of my favorites, is pecan pie. It's like, oh, God. so we're eating, and I'm like totally oblivious. I totally forgot like while we're there, you know, I'm thinking. And they go, well, should we start talking about the life insurance thing? Oh, okay. So I put my stuff out. Do you think I closed it? Yes. I walk out of there, my first appointment, I'm going, God, I love this industry. Full tummy, I'm going, man, this is great. But accept anything that's offered. Now, when it comes to alcohol, hey, do you want a beer? I've never had a situation where I say, look, man, I'm working, and you know, I'd, love to, I'd love to have some, but you know, now's not a good time because I'm working. And that's a good excuse, you know, I'm driving, I'm working. You know, Oh, but man, some other time, man, when we're, you know, you're having a picnic, call me. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be shooting some down with you, brother. You know, you know what I'm saying? That's also a good thing. If you can get them laughing, it's done. I, whenever I've gotten a client to laugh in the home with me and we're just joking around, that rapport is so strong. I, I, can ne I can't remember a time where I didn't close the deal. I didn't take care of that family when we got them laughing. You know, and you can tell I kind of have this kind of crazy personality anyway, so I mean, you know. It's not hard for me to do it, but look, if you're not naturally funny and if you just are, don't have a humorous bone in your body, buy a book on humor, okay? <laughs> Change your personality. No, you don't gotta have a crazy personality like mine, but and that's just the thing I'm after. <laughs> okay, control the environment. If the TV's on, ask them to turn the TV off. Hey, I really only wanna be here about 10 minutes, but if the TV's on, I'm going to have to do the three-hour version of the presentation. <laughs> and you, I'm sure you don't want me in here three hours, do you? They laugh. Turn the TV off, right? Okay. If their kids are running around, hey, can we put the kids in the closet so that we can do it? <laughs> Basement. Hey, is anyone with kids to go play outside the street? I mean, play outside the backyard, <laughs> the playground. I mean, you know, it's like kids are sometimes real distracting, okay? If they have a pet, like a dog that comes up and sticks their they're snouting your crotch, and you're trying to go like this, okay? Ask them to please, like, can you put the dog in the closet or in the cage or put the dog outside? I mean, I don't know about you, I've had dogs nipping, like, the whole time they're biting my thing, and I'm trying to act, like, real cool and going, like, it's just like, i got to close this, but this dog is driving me crazy. <laughs> Take control because it will drive you crazy, drive them crazy. You try to act like normal, and they know the dog's pissing you off. You know. Anyway, so take control there. Okay. Um, look, you're there to protect them. The making the friend part happens later, but you have to establish. You know, because like, are you friends with your doctor? I don't know too many people that are really close friends with their doctor because your doctor comes in, you're wearing a t piece of tissue, and he's telling you to bend over, bend over, look to the right and cough. He's doing all this stuff to you, and he's like this clinician with gloves on, and there's like no relationship. 
That means you're just trying to get fixed. Okay, I'm asking you to be just a little bit of a step above that. Okay, and you're there to take care of them. Okay, you can be a friend later, but, and you know what? All this stuff takes 90 seconds. It's about 90 seconds. You know, by the time you get through all of it. But you know what they say, first impressions are made in the first 30 seconds. Let me give you a, a name of a book that will totally make this process. If you're like terrible, Nelson, if uh, you know, people just don't like you when they meet you, this book, I promise you, will change all of that. It's a book called How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less by Nicholas Boothman. Okay, How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less. Nicholas Boothman. You know, Booth, like Clark Kent's dressing room. Okay, a Booth man. M-A-N, Nicholas Boothman. And this book, you know what this book covers? <coughs> this book covers how to get people to like you in 90 <laughs> seconds, okay? That's what this book covers. And if you do it in 90 seconds and instead of 15 minutes, guess what you save a bunch of time, 14 and a half minutes. You know, is that cool? I mean, 13 and a half minutes. <coughs> this, and this stuff, this guy's a neurolinguistic programming guy, NLP guy, which I'm, I'm a big NLP proponent. And that's, you know, Sales 404. Okay, I'm not going to teach you NLP stuff in here, but he'll give you some very basic things on how to get that report done quickly. So yes, this is part, Rich, of your 48 hours of study. I'm going to short it for you. Part of your six hours, you know, three hours to learn a presentation, you know, three hours to read a book like this, that will help you create that report. If it's not, have you ever bought anything from somebody you didn't like, that you didn't trust, and you didn't believe? No. You do that. And you're in the game, okay? You're in the game. So that's the bonding report process. Okay, let's talk about pain. Now, I, I think back to when I had my, my toothache. Has anyone had a toothache in here where it was the kind of toothache that brought tears to your eyes, that throbbing you tried to take out? Have you had one of those? It's like, kill me now. Like, I want to die. And that pain is just in your head. It's so purple here that it causes a headache and stress. And all you think about, you close your eyes, you open your eyes, it's just there. You try to take like ibuprofen and it doesn't curb it in one little bit. And I remember back you know, two, about two years ago that I had this. And it was like on a Friday, Donna, after work hours was over. And I was like dying here. I was laying and just putting like cold compress on everywhere and it just wouldn't, you know, and I wouldn't do anything. Man, I was like, I'm, I'm going to go to West Dayton and get someone to hook me up, you know, hook me up with methadone or something like that. I'm serious. I was like crazy. Okay, not that I advocate building <laughs> activity. But fortunately, I live in a neighborhood of doctors surround me everywhere. I have all these oncologists and heart surgeons and, you know, Fortunately, my buddy doctors have sample versions of Vicodin, okay? <laughs> oh my God. I was like, you know how you see junkies that are high? I was like, oh, I'm normal. <laughs> I was normal. It, it stopped. You know how desperate that is? This is what I'm talking about in the pain process. How do you know where someone hurts? How, what does a doctor do when you sit down? What's he do, Barry? Starts questioning you. That's right. He starts asking you, so what's the problem? Doctor, it hurts when I do this. No, don't do that, right? Okay. Pain. People will do extraordinary things to subside pain, okay, versus gaining a pleasure. Pleasure is fleeting. Pleasure is fun, it creates memories, but then you're on with your life. But pain is constant. Pain is ongoing. You want to stop the pain. And if you don't stop it, it's going to come back. Right? You want to get rid of it. Okay, so that's the mentality that you want to put in your client's head. Is I want to get rid of what hurts. And that's where we ask questions. Okay? Now, what we simply do to open up this process, Don, is we, we get to copy the lead. Who's got a copy of the lead? Do you have a copy of the lead? Okay, well, we'll pretend this is a copy of the lead. Okay, we take the lead. We say, Joe and Mary, what was the main reason for sending this in? Joe, was it to take care of Mary and the kids if you got X'd out of the picture? 
and then you shut up. Don't say another word, okay? Don't say anything. Why'd you send this in? What was the most important thing to you when you sent this in? You can do a whole bunch of questions, but the gist is, why, what was the most important thing on your mind when you sent this in? You know, was it to take care of Mary and the kids if you got X out of the picture? Something to that extent. Okay, we now in our you know in our system we have very specific um, things to say here. What we say is, George and Alice, which one of these benefits is most important to you? On the mortgage lead, it has the four benefits: death benefit, disability program, unemployment um, waiver premium, and the return of premium program. It shows four bullets. Okay, some of your leads don't have those four bullets. If it has the four bullets, which is a direct mail mortgage lead. You turn that to them and say, George and Alice, which one of these benefits is most important to you? Was it to cover your mortgage in case you were taken out of the picture? And then you shut up, okay? The most powerful closing technique, Alan, is silence. The silence that you create to get them to talk, all right? So whenever you ask questions, just shut up. The first person that answers loses. Okay, if you start answering, you know, I'd suggest no. Other questions you can ask here. Have you two sat down to discuss the financial impact um, or changes you'd be forced to make if one of you did not wake up in the morning? Or you didn't make it home from work? Have you two sat down to discuss what would happen? But it's a basic question, isn't it? Because you know what? When my wife got married in and I got married in 1991, you know how long it took us to even talk about life insurance? It took us about five years. You know what happened in, after the, in that, during that time is we had our first child. All that time we didn't like ever have those conversations. People just don't. You know, they're, you're laying in bed. You don't, hey, Jenny, let's talk about life insurance tomorrow. That topic never comes up in normal conversations. Number one, it's unpleasant. You never want to think about you dying tomorrow and the financial impact. It just doesn't happen. The first time, a lot of times, is when they sent that lead in. And you're in there to help them discuss something that's unpleasant. That's why it's your job to do it. All right? Just last week, one of our agents in Chicago, in fact, I called, I, I left a message to his buddy the, um, several days before about this business. This is someone I was contacting about possibly joining our business team, okay, in Chicago. Well, he told me that they were evaluating other businesses, he and his friend, okay, his other friend, and then there was another lady in L.A. that I also left a message for, and these were million-dollar earners that were looking for another opportunity. And she was supposed to be in this plane. Well, this other program that wanted to, them to join them was um, flew them out in a private aircraft to, to Utah, Salt Lake City. And about 200 feet off the runway, a wind shear, a downward wind draft, hit the plane, went nose into the tarmac, into the runway. They died in, in just seconds it happened. Wow. Now I was talking to um, one of our agents who was a balloon pilot. Okay, he's also a private air. He goes, yeah man, those come out of nowhere. And there's nothing you can do. There is nothing you can do. And I was thinking, and my agent, Andrew, was like, he was like devastated. Now imagine what that other lady felt like. She was supposed to be on that plane, but she couldn't make it. And he, and you know what? He had trouble closing clients because he just, he was having trouble taking care of families. And when that happened, he goes, oh my gosh. They woke up that morning, Alan, thinking that they were gonna fly out, see an opportunity, fly back home to California. They were gonna have dinner with their family but the wind shear ended their lives right in that two second period of time. Andrew freaked out because Andrew, who's a life insurance agent, brand new life insurance agent, has no life insurance. So you know what he did? The next day, he got a policy for himself. And then he realized, you know what, Alex? It wasn't a priority in my life when I was trying to sell people I couldn't make it a priority in their life. His whole attitude's changed. He, he's at the, he was at the funeral the last couple days. He's flying back home. 
And now he's got a renewed sense of what he's doing in this business. You know, so now he has his own policy, thank God. Okay, so pain. Have you two sat down to discuss the financial changes you'd be forced to make? Specifically, what would you do? Have him go through the whole scenario, man. So, so Mary, Joe's dead. Okay, and Joe, you're dead, so you can't talk. Tomorrow you're gone. Okay, Mary, describe your situation to me. What would you do? And then I just ask practical questions. So how long do you think you'd stay in the house? Uh, and I, I do a technique called negative reverse. Uh, I'm not going to try to teach it to you, but, uh, but hear how I ask questions. So I say, well, you probably have enough income on your part-time job to pay the mortgage, don't you? Hear how I phrased it? I didn't phrase it like, uh, oh, you couldn't possibly stay in the house. See, when you phrase it like that, they start thinking, well, yeah. It's offensive, yeah. Offensive. But when I say, oh, I'm sure you have enough income on your part-time job to pay the mortgage, right? You still stay in the house, right? No. Well, I'm sure you can probably get family to help you pay the mortgage, right? It's a mortgage, yeah. $1,500 a month. What's your part-time bring home? About $1,500. So you have family that could probably help you? Well, maybe one or two mortgage payments. Well, I'm sure your husband has savings to put away that probably covered the mortgage for the next two, three years, right? No. Hmm. See what I'm doing? I'm letting it, I'm letting that answer kind of reverberate in the room. So you know who hears it? Joe hears it. And then if Joe starts to talk, hey, Joe, you're dead, man. I'm sorry, but you're dead. You can't help her because you didn't take care of this today. You died tomorrow. And I do it nice. I'm smiling. Okay, so, well, let me ask you, how long can you stay in the house? A year before they foreclose on you? Oh, I don't know, six months? Okay. So they foreclose on the house, sheriff's sale, house is gone. What do you do now? I'm sure you'll have family that'll take you in, right? Well, yeah, my, my, my mom probably can. Okay, great. So where does your mom live? Well, she lives in another state, Columbus, Ohio. Oh, okay, Columbus, Ohio. Well, I'm sure she has room for you, right? She can turn that sewing room and she'll put you and your three kids in there. I mean, it'd be, I don't know. Oh. Um, and your kids, they go to private school, public school. Oh, they go to private school. Well, I'm sure you can find a good private school in, uh, you know, because they're pretty cheap out there in Columbus, aren't they? Oh, we couldn't afford that. They'd have to go to public school. Public school? See, there's a reason why they put them in private school, right? So they wouldn't have to go to public school. See, I'm taking it to where it's like hell for them. I'm making him hear everything she's going to have to go through. And then I, when I make it like when when it is her hurting, hurting, hurting. These are just simple questions. I'm not saying to be the psychologist. I'm just saying just ask very simple questions. And then when you got it to where it is unbearable, and they may even rescue themselves. Hey, this ain't gonna happen. Joe, I'll say, hey Joe. So what do you think about Mary having to go through all that? And he's gonna sit there. What's he gonna say? Sure, she can go through that. She's tough. Oh, sure, she'll marry somebody to take care of her. Uh, we usually actually have people say that, at least where, where I am in Ohio. I, and I'm like rolling my eyes. It's like, man, I can't help you. Because Mary, the first mistake you made was marrying this loser. I, mean, I don't say that, okay? I, don't trust me, I don't say that. But I let him be the hero. All right, it's not going to happen here. Do you think it's done? Do you think we've closed them? Absolutely, because I took the pain, okay? Once you get good at this, because you've got to practice it, you can ask all those questions. So I'm going to presume for the new people that you're, you're going to be scared to do it, right? Because you're going to be uncomfortable to make them uncomfortable. That's kind of our nature. We just want everything to be happy. and We want everything to go smoothly. Go a new sale, because I was that way when I got started. So I know you're going to be that way. So what I'm going to say to you, and I don't want you to be mad by saying this, Okay, Nelson, 
is that your concern about how you feel is selfish. Because you're thinking about you, you're not thinking about that family you're trying to take care of, or are you? And that's a selfish attitude. Be unselfish and put them in an uncomfortable situation where they're feeling the pain. Okay, because here's the pain process. They're feeling well when you shake their hands at the door. Your job is to get them feeling sick. Then you make them feel that they're critically ill. They're critical. And once you get them critical, you rescue them by making them well. And how you rescue them is this powerful transition statement. It's called, that's why I'm here. Is that easy? That's why I'm here. I'm going to fix this situation for you. I'm going to help you, Joe, so that Mary and the children never have to go through that. Would that be okay? That's another test close. Would that be okay? Oh, yeah, that would be okay. Great. All right? So some of the other examples of questions, what would you do? How long could you, either of you live in the home? Here's another good one. This is one that I love to ask because this, this is the, the key question to move you into other questions is, what are the consequences of not taking care of this now? I like asking the other, it's an opposite way of asking questions. What are the consequences of not taking care of this today? And that's the launch off question to ask all those other questions. Okay. You ask all those questions, you make it part, and then the transition is that's why I'm here. I'm going to fix that. Would that be okay with you? You've closed the pain. Now, what we have in our, in our system is we have a thing called the mortgage protection data sheet. Okay. In our mortgage protection data sheet, what we ask them, and, and a lot of systems don't have that, so, um, you know, it's how we, what we do is we interview them to find out, um, the purpose of the mortgage protection data sheet is to really find out, number one, um, basic information to identify an annuity. So we ask them, how long have you been at your current job? Okay, our mortgage protection data sheet looks like this, okay? And, and all it really is is a questionnaire for us to really pre-screen them before we show them something, right? Because the worst thing, Alan, is you show them a rate and then you start filling out the medical application part of medical history and you find out, crap, they don't qualify for this product. Then you have to retrace your steps, right? That's not fun, okay? You want to know up front, right, Don? You want to know up front what they'll probably be in the range for before you even show them pricing. So we use this questionnaire and it has Age, current employer, how long you work there, what your, what's your salary? Because the salary you're going to put on the, on the application anyway. Um, do you have any 401k? You know, when you ask questions like how long you've been at your employer, then it opens up, well, I've been here five years. Oh, okay, who did you work for before? I worked for GM. Oh, did you take your 401k money from there? No, it's still there. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, don't start drooling. You're not going to close an annuity at this <laughs> juncture. You just have uncovered one. Okay, tobacco use, last 12 months, so and so. A lot of times what we like to do is ask the tobacco question assumptively. So how long have you been a smoker? Oh, I've never smoked a day in my life. Oh, okay, great. Well, I quit. Why don't you quit? about an hour ago before you showed up. <laughs> yeah, clients will do that. Well, I quit about six months ago. Oh, okay. okay. Don't, I won't say a thing. I just said, okay, great. Um, okay, the first thing we ask, we want to know their medical situation, so um, what medications are you taking and for what conditions? See, I want to know their medical, I ask them up front, because I want to know what they qualify for so I can show them the right product they're going to be able to get into. Okay. And, in, in, and what we teach on the phone is we find out some of the basic health problems on the phone before we go in. Okay. 
after we put the appointment. Okay, we'll talk about that. But I want to know what the medications are. And I asked some specific things like any heart problems, diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, cancer. Those are kind of the big ones. Heart problems, diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, cancer. Those tend to be the bigger ones that will knock someone way out of the simplified issue. When's the last time you saw the doctor for what reason? If they say, well, about 10 years ago, Donna, would you be excited by, by, to put that guy through a fully underwritten blood and urine product? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Probably it's like, that's the worst time to find out there's something wrong with you, right, during a life insurance exam. So I want to know last time they saw the doctor for what reason, because, you know, by the way, this is also on the application. So you're kind of getting a lot of the preliminary application questions out of the way, but it gives you a chance to figure out what product to show them. Any surgeries or overnight stays in the hospital, and why? And this form doesn't take very long. This is about five minutes or less for both of them, okay? So that shows me whether or not what product I'm going to show them. The next section gives me a, an indication whether or not I should show them some additional riders on the product. So Joe and Mary, do you have any major, do you have major medical at work, health insurance at work, and disability programs at work? I want to know that. Because if they don't, like a lot of companies are getting rid of those benefits, then that gives me an opportunity to maybe show them a disability rider, right, or a critical illness rider. But if they're all taken care of there, I don't try to push that on them. I only want to sell them what they will want and need, not what they don't want, that a big slick sales process is going to have to you know, convince them that they need, right? Then the last one, do you save money on a regular blade basis? Do you have a regular savings program? Why do I ask that question? Do they save money? That's right, do they save money? Do you think that if someone who says, well, Alex, we're living hand to mouth right now, we just don't have enough really to save anything extra, do you think I'm going to sell them a return of premium program on my mortgage term product, Gary? They won't see the value. They won't see the value in it. But Donna, the return of premium program, they get all their money back at the end of 30 years. It's a forced savings program if they can't afford it it's going to fall off the books that's right the key is forced savings it's funny when people tell me that well that's the forced savings program okay when's the last time you had your kid clean the room did you force them to clean the room yeah okay did you have to force them the next day well yeah the key quiet the key word there is forced so don't think you're going to touch show someone who doesn't value money now, now, Barry, if the guy says, oh, well, absolutely, we have a Roth IRA. We're putting money away in Index Universal Life to create cash value. We've got, we've got stocks. We've got a real big 401k program. And uh, I'm teaching my kids to save money, too. And we tithe to our church. Oh, really? Now, do you think that's a good candidate to show them the return of premium rider? Absolutely. Absolutely. They will love it. They'll laugh it up. They don't care if they have to pay double for it because they understand the value of bringing that, of paying more for their insurance to get that money back when they're, gonna, when, when they're alive at the end of the term. This unlocks what to show them. It only takes about five minutes. That's all part of the paying process. You've got to want to, number one, you've got to find out their pain. Number two, you've got to figure out what solution you're going to use to solve their pain. Because if someone says, I'm allergic to penicillin, do you think a doctor is going to prescribe penicillin? The only way they know if you're allergic to penicillin, Don, is if you ask them, right? Guy asks the questions. This is what we use, the more protection data sheet. Okay? Do you have a plant pharmacy to share with us?